What makes a good story? Man, that's a loaded question. Okay, let's try it like this. What are some of your favorite stories? I personally love Harry Potter, and I'm obsessed with Stranger Things. I'm serious, I binge watch that over a weekend. Now what makes these stories good? Where do I start? I love the characters. I love the setting. I love the dialogue. And I love a good quest. That really does it for me. When the writer really hits the nail on the head with the right kind of quest. You know, when the main character has this super important mission she's trying to solve, and all her friends really rally around her to take down the bad guy. That's the best. Harry Potter tries to take down the Dark Lord. Mike and Eleven try to take down the Demogorgon. I'm serious, when I don't know what's going on and there are like 10 different storylines all happening at the same time, that's when I decide I'm going to give up on the show, on the second episode of the first season. Right, so having a clear quest. Now that makes a good story. But storytelling is so hard. Trying to figure out all of these things together at once. What kind of quest do you want to share? How do you want to share it? Who are your characters? What are their backgrounds? It's a lot. But writers and authors, they focus on defining that quest for their characters. Okay, so what am I getting at here? Newsflash. We have the exciting opportunity to tell stories every single day, at home, at school, and even at work. Every day when I'm at work, I get to tell stories. But I tell them with data. And that's where I'd like to spend our time today. The power in effective data storytelling. You guys, I'm gonna hit the punchline right at the beginning here, but data storytelling and storytelling, they're exactly the same. They follow the same starting points and the same execution. Now, before I get way too ahead of myself, data. We hear about it every single day. What is it? I personally like to think of it as a collection of facts that describes something. The numbers one through 10. Your Spotify playlist. The total number of hours that you all spent at CAMS last night. Yeah, I know. We are surrounded by data. In fact, a 2017 Forbes article writes that more data has been produced in the last two years than in the entire previous history of the human race. That's insane. Why does this matter? Would you believe me if I told you that less than half a percent of this data is ever used? Half a percent. That's almost like living in a universe with billions of planets, but deciding that we're only gonna use one to sustain life. Naturally, I'm sure you have the same question I do. Where do we start with all of this? What story do we tell? Now, this vastness of data might turn others off, but I've realized that data experts, the people that spend 10,000 hours mastering this art, they aren't just great business leaders. They're some of the world's best storytellers. And the key to being a good data storyteller a focused understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. Also known as having a clear quest. And that's just step one. Today, I'd like to share with you a framework I use to tell stories with data. I'll share it with one simple, simple objective to encourage this room to talk about data, to use it, and most exciting of all, tell compelling stories with it. So let's begin. To tell an effective story with data, there's three parts. 
in this specific order. The problem, the solution, and the inputs. Let's begin. Chapter one, the problem. There's a famous quote, loosely attributed to Albert Einstein, who said that if he had one hour to save our planet, he'd spend 59 of those minutes defining the problem, and only one of those minutes actually saving the world. What does that even mean? Perhaps we ought to look to an example closer at hand. Let's rewind to the year 1992. The creator of the world's first smartphone was actually IBM, and they called it the Simon Personal Communicator. It was an all-inclusive device that jam-packed all of the best technology of the day. An LCD touchscreen, a notes collector, and a few other features. You can imagine that by trying to do all of this, they didn't do very much quite well. In fact, the battery wiped out within an hour. Think about how annoying that would be. And it cost a whopping $899. Strangely enough, if you survey them, users probably wanted a device that was easy to use, had a long battery life, and maybe even stored a few of their contacts. So this begs the question, what problem was IBM even solving? They failed to define that core issue way up front, and that's why I bet none of you know what the Simon Personal Communicator is. So chapter one, what are you solving for? Really, really, really think about this, guys. What are you solving for? Now, let's go through an example to make this real. You work at Soy Milk Queen, a nationwide ice cream chain. Your ice cream chain sells a wide variety of milk alternative ice creams. Soy milk, almond milk, coconut milk, cashew milk, you get it. Revenue has been down for the past few years, and your boss wants to know why. She hands you a giant data set of all the sales of the United States and says, tell me what you find. Deep breath. You can do this. Now, before jumping into the data set, take a step back. Close your laptop and grab a piece of paper. You can realistically answer hundreds of questions with this data set alone. But a good data storyteller knows that she needs to start by precisely defining her quest. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to define our quest for Soy Milk Queen. Let's make that quest, which one of our ice cream flavors is the worst selling? OK, perfect. Problem defined. Simple. We're understanding the lay of the land. And we're closing out chapter one. What are you solving for? All right, chapter two, the solution. The second part to being an effective data storyteller is actually making that solution useful and actionable. Let's call this part of our framework the protagonist's game plan. Seriously, when Harry Potter didn't know what horcruxes were in the earlier books, he struggled to figure out how exactly he was going to take down the Dark Lord. And the same goes for me although not as serious. There have been so many situations where my teams at work didn't take the time to define the problem and then think about what our solution looked like. And it led to hours and hours of me staring at my laptop, going from one skinny ice mocha, sub almond milk with an extra shot of blonde espresso to another. So once we've done chapter one, defined our problem, we move to chapter two. Understanding the merits of a good solution. Now let's jump back to that Soy Milk Queen example to really contextualize this part of our framework. You'll recall that our quest was to figure out which one of our ice cream flavors wasn't selling so well. So what does success look like with this analysis? What is our protagonist's game plan? Well, if I were to answer the following three questions, I think I will have solved my problem at hand. Those questions being, one, what are all of the flavors that I sell anyways? Two, how much of each do we sell? And three, how often do we restock? Okay, this is my game plan. If I do this right, I'm going to solve my problem. Understanding the solution.
intuition and your game plan is so important. How it tastes, feels, looks. In fact, when I was an analyst at McKinsey, I legitimately spent evenings writing out a beautiful PowerPoint presentation full of exciting graphs without any data. I'm serious. I draw out imaginary graphs of what the data would hopefully tell me after I had completed an analysis. We called them ghost decks. At the kicker, my teams would actually sit down and we'd debate whether these imaginary graphs were the right imaginary graphs to go solve our problem. We understood the importance of having a game plan and what success looked like way up front before crunching any numbers. Knowing that solution is unbelievably important. So for our final piece, the inputs. In the case of our protagonist trying to fulfill her quest, she needs a good toolkit, a map, a wand, and a way to get around. But not just any map. She needs the Marauder's map. Not just any wand. She needs the Elder wand. And not just any way to get around. She needs the Nimbus 2000. With data storytelling, how good your solution or analysis is stems from how good your raw data is. Plain and simple, your number one toolkit. These are the roots to a good solution. So once I've closed out chapter one, defined my problem, closed out chapter two, understood the solution, I moved to chapter three. Understanding what my raw inputs actually are. Now, I'm going to jump back to our Swindle Queen example one last time. Although your boss is the one that handed you this data set, question it. Where is it from? How credible is that source? How complete is this data? Why might there be missingness? How is this data collected, cleaned, brought together, and managed? Know this in and out. A protagonist set up for success has the best toolkit. In fact, she takes care of her tools, and her quest would be quite unachievable without the right ones. That's how important it is for data storytelling, too. So, I'm about to wrap up here, and I know what you're thinking. Matt, we haven't looked at any data. We haven't analyzed any data. That's okay. I've learned that going through the motions of this framework, defining your problem, understanding what the solution and what success looks like, and finally thinking about your raw inputs, that's 80% of it. The final 20% is the actual execution, or the number crunching. So we agree that to tell a good story with data, we need a quest. But what about the best stories? The ones that you run home to tell your families about? The ones that score 98% or more on Rotten Tomatoes? The ones that take home the Oscar? What about those stories? There's something different about those stories. They have a plot twist. A moment in the story that fundamentally changes the course of the narrative. You guys, that's what I look for and get excited about when I write stories with data too. A piece of data evidence that fundamentally changes a human heuristic. A plot twist moment that changes how our business runs. And I'm so lucky that I get to do this every day at Circle Up, an investment platform that writes data stories to fundamentally change consumer packaged goods investing. And what about our lovely soy milk queen example? What if we found out, after we had done our analysis, that the milk alternative ice cream flavor that was the worst selling was actually the one with soy milk? What a twist! <laughs> Guys, data is not intimidating. It's simple. It's creative. And it has the power to be incredibly compelling. I encourage this room to give this framework a shot, whether it relates to data or not. 
I've learned that going through these motions has saved me time, kept me focused, made me a better communicator, and honestly made me a better thinker. Maybe, hopefully, it does the same for you. Thank you.